Hello everyone, Eric Swenson here for the Institute of Lutheran Theology Chapel. I have a message today based on next Sunday's Old Testament reading, 2 Samuel chapters 11 and reaching into chapter 12 verse 15. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she lamented over her husband, and when the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, who was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest, who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. And gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. Here ends the reading. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Oh my, no ambiguity in this text, is there? David sinned and was caught. Now, you know, David, as a psalmist, wrote one of the most memorable lines in Scripture when he wrote in Psalm 51, My sin is ever before me. And here, his sin is rubbed in his face, as it were, by the prophet Nathan. You are the man. David, the shepherd boy turned warrior and then king, is held up in scripture as a model for us. And several times as a model of what not to do. This too is obvious. The Bible does this saint yet sinner thing many times. It is hard to name a major figure who did not have feet of clay. Abraham, whom we hold up as a model of trusting God, puts his faith in his own understanding at several critical junctures. Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land. So you would think that not only church people, but 
everyone would get the point that when it comes down to it, there is no perfect person. But we do not. We build people up and then crucify them. We do this to ourselves even. Vanity, vanity. My friends, vanity is vanity. That is, it's vain. It's, there's no point. David's in-your-face sin. What was it? Murder and lust, right? Open and shut case of charges were to be read against the accused in court. What was it he was accused of? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife in a conspiracy to murder, adultery, right? But look again. What was the first charge? Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? Oh my. Why have you despised the word of the Lord? After naming his crime of murder and lust, the prophet speaks for the Lord and says, I anointed you. I made you king over Israel and describes how he gave him everything that had belonged to the previous king. Were not Saul's wives and concubines enough? But see, listen, what began with a wandering eye, the eye was already wandering. And then sexual lust, when he saw Bathsheba taking a bath, it was not really about lust. David was already in trouble. Why did he have a wandering eye? But more so, why had he decided not to go out with his army? That little bit of information in the 15th chapter is important. He had already decided his fate, perhaps, when he decided this battle did not require that he actually be physically present. So why was he not vigilant? But what is the root of his great sin here, his premeditated murder? It was pride, was it not? Pride it was at another calamity of David's. Remember the story about David wanting to do a census? His desire there was not his, about his administrative style. It was about wanting to, everyone to know what a great king he was, how his name would go down in history. It was pride, and it almost cost him his life, and not only his, but many of his people. There was a lesson here, in, of course, for political leaders. We see it time and time again. Men who have everything. Wealth, power, office, family, the respect and even adoration of the majority, and they lose it all or nearly all when they are caught committing adultery. We may not be the virtuous Christian nation that we once were, or think that we were, but we still like to build people up and then crucify them. No. In all these cases, it is never only about lust. It's about thinking that they are special and that they deserve that special something, whatever it was or is that their wandering eye sees and they desire. This is not just a lesson for political leaders, but a lesson for pastors. Pastors get caught doing the same thing. But it's not just a lesson for pastors. It's a lesson for all leaders. It's not just a lesson for leaders. It's also a lesson for followers. It's a lesson for everyone. It's a lesson for parents. And it's a lesson for children. It's a lesson for us all. Whenever we think we're special, Oh my, whenever we think, did God really say? Why have you despised the word of the Lord? Oh my, I stand accused. All of the sudden, when I think about this, 
when I hear this, I see myself also in the docket. See, I know this thing. That whenever I am faced with temptation, with real temptation, I am also tempted to despise the word of the Lord. It goes hand in hand because I already know what's the right thing to do. What else is it but to despise when we do not respect? So, what? Am I alone here? Standing before the judge alone? Or is everyone here? We're all here. We stand accused of despising the law. And this now we have come and with this, we have come to the most important point. The issue that is so in your face. I do not even have to say it. The law has already accused you, hasn't it? You probably heard it when the lesson was read. Or already when I proclaimed it earlier in the sermon. You know, the same pride that was at work in David and in our promiscuous politicians. And not just the sexually promiscuous, but all. All who think that they are above the law. The samely, same deadly pride is at work. And what must we do? Well, first of all, sinner, admit your sin. What do we do? We need to admit our sin. No, no, can't be. This is too simple. No, it is enough, because one has already stood in the docket for us. Jesus Christ took all the sin of the world upon himself. We crucified him. We threw him a party on Palm Sunday, and we killed him for Passover. But Good Friday became Easter, and his resurrection power became ours at Pentecost. He is the man. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. We love him and we love you for sending him to us to be not only our savior, but to be our stay in this life. To be there for us when we need him for discernment and for strength. We thank you because that salvation Today is salvation for eternity. Lord, we pray for each other. We pray for everybody listening. We pray for the Institute of Lutheran Theology and all its students, its professors, its staff, and its supporters. We pray for your Evangelical Lutheran Church everywhere to give it good leaders, that our preachers might proclaim your law and gospel and truth and have the strength to stand up for what is necessary. We thank you for everything and we praise your name for what you're doing in our lives today and will be doing tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Thank you very much for being here.